Hi, uh, welcome. In my series on science, today we'll talk about Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, which is essentially the theory of how life came to be on this planet. See, any species cannot truly be cast as intelligent until it really starts to wonder where it comes from. Uh, and these are very important philosophical questions, uh, and the answers can be very troublesome. Uh, and there are myriad of answers available from scientific to religious. Today we'll discuss what science has to say on this matter. There are many possible hypotheses, one of which is that life and the universe has existed as we see it today uh, in infinite time in the past. There is another hypothesis of creationism that some external being has created life at some point in the past. And the third hypothesis is rather interesting which says that at some point in the past life started originating or evolving from simple atoms which continue to evolve into much complicated and smart organisms that we see around us today. Let's discuss these hypotheses. The infinite past hypothesis seems philosophically troublesome particularly to me that that the universe has always existed just like as we see it today. Science believes the scientific view is that this is not the case that universe has not existed in the infinite past that it has a specific birth date and that a long time ago there was no earth there was no there were no uh, stars uh, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about the big bang and the origin of the universe uh, for now this rules out the first hypothesis the second hypothesis is of creationism that that at some point in the past an external being which we call god uh, created uh, life now it could be true uh, but the problem that I find with it is that it does not really answer uh, how intelligent life comes to be. Because you see, if, if an external being created us and the external being is intelligent, how does that intelligent being come to be? I mean, was he, was the God, do they have their own gods or do they happen to be around for infinite time in the past. So you see, it's not clear how intelligent life comes to be in this hypothesis. Because if God created us, who created God? And have they been around for the infinite time in the past? Or do they have their own gods? The third hypothesis is of evolution. And this is very interesting. It says that it, it is not necessary to have an external being or an external creator for life to happen. That life can happen with the working under the laws of the universe if you take simple atoms that these simple atoms can turn into molecules which can turn into single celled organisms and then it can evolve slightly over time such that they become smarter and smarter and complex and complex as that they eventually become so smart that we be they one day start to wonder hmm where do i come from and that's that is one of the hypotheses that how humans have come to be on this planet Today, we will discuss that which of these hypotheses uh, science uh, believes is true. Uh, the mystery of life has been called the mystery of mysteries. And today, we will try to resolve the mystery. We will talk about Charles Darwin and his, uh, and his work of lifetime, which he published in his book, The Origins of Species. He went on a voyage around the world for five years and he collected a lot of evidence. And we will also discuss the basic insights uh, that led him to his discovery. Let's talk about the works before Charles Darwin. Uh, one of the leading views at that time was that the species were immutable, that that God had created distinct species, man, and then birds, and then and then uh, pigeons, and then and then dogs and cats and lions, etc. And that the species had an order, like there were plants and on top of which there were the animals and on top of the animals were the humans and up above the humans were gods in the skies. Similarly, the famous botanist Carl Linnaeus, who was a Swedish botanist, he started categorizing these uh, various organisms. He started, he's, he led the foundation of the biological nomenclature that we see around us and he first categorized the animals into species. Uh, a, a species was was categorized by the set of animals that could breed within themselves and uh, within a species there were a lot of varieties or races now there were still some un unanswered questions at that time and people and scientists realized that one of which was that if if god had created uh, species in a particular order why were there so many variety of species why were there for example so many 
pigeons so many various pigeons why were there so many variety of dogs why were there so many variety of cats and secondly why could a particular animal be associated by just looking at a particular animal an experienced person could tell that hmm, I think this this animal was originated in the Middle East How, wh why was it that uh, different varieties of species tend to be associated with different locations let's talk about Lamarck so Lamarck proposed a very good idea that species were not constant and that they changed or evolved over time and he primarily focused on two main works one of which was that by using their organs very frequently animals tend to strengthen those organs for example if you use your hand a lot it will grow muscles if if and similarly if you don't use a particular organ and for example if you don't use your eyes for a long time if you live in a dark cave then eventually the organs will deteriorate and eventually they will they will uh, go away similarly all the acquired the second thing he focused on was that all these characteristics that you acquire over lifetime they are passed on to your children those were the two main things now this work was however slightly incomplete and incorrect for example the first law really is just an exaggeration of saying that by by using a particular organ it strengthens but it doesn't really tell how an organism evolves uh, he also made some wrong assumptions such that the, he said that organisms have a tendency to move to increase in complexity and move the ladder up in the progress but he it, he didn't really answer why organisms wanted to progress or wanted to become more complex. It is primarily his second law or second word rule that is considered his legacy that characteristics acquired by animals are passed on via heredity to their children. Charles Darwin was born in 1809 in England to a very wealthy family and his father wanted to him to become a doctor but he was more inclined to become a naturalist. He attended Cambridge where he was introduced to various naturalists at the time and one of which was Paley who argued that that uh, because the organs of human body were so complex that it uh, was probably a good hypothesis to assume that an external being had created us. Darwin when he graduated even though he was supposed to go for further studies he decided to take an offer to go around the world on a research ship HMS Beagle. HMS Beagle left uh, England in 1831 and it was supposed to go on this research mission for two years but it would not return for five. He, Darwin was an unpaid naturalist on the ship. While on the ship, the captain of the ship gave Darwin a very good book uh, called Principles of Geology that was written by the geologist just, uh, Charles Lyell. Lyell argued that the surface of the earth ha was not created by a flood or anything or any catastrophe. It was created or sculpted over long periods of time and it had gradually evolved over long periods of time. So this very idea that, the, that something changes over time gradually so much that eventually you don't recognize what it started from this idea had a profound impact on Darwin and his own experiences during the voyage backed the geologist's theories he the another thing that that astonished uh, uh, Darwin was that the variety of creatures or organisms that he met during his voyage for example in 1835 the beagle landed on the islands of Galapagos in near Chile and the creatures of Galapagos really astonished uh, Darwin. For example, there were lizards who could swim and these were the only kind of lizards Darwin had ever heard of that could swim. And there was a similar variety of lizards that uh, lived on land. There were oversized tortoises uh, and which were unique to each island. I mean, you could take a look at the tortoise and you could tell that mm, this particular tortoise comes from this island, the other one comes from that island. And in particular, of particular importance are the species of bird, which were finches, the importance of which Darwin did not uh, recognize at the time, but he brought the specimen back with him to England. And when these specimens were presented to the famous ornithologist John Gould, he, he 
announced that they were all finches and this really astonished uh, Darwin because he had not thought of those specimens as uh, connected at all he they, these birds were very different in shape and size and there was a huge range of variation between them so when Beagle returned to England in 1836 Darwin began to assemble all the evidence that he had collected into a single coherent theory there were many things that he had noticed one of which was that the birds of Galapagos were all related and this argued that they once had a common ancestor similarly the fact that those tortoises uh, came from different islands and you could tell that this tortoise came from this island argued that they once had a common ancestor each family derived from a common ancestor and Darwin himself was a member of the pigeon club in London and he ran his own experiments on pigeon and he could find that you could change a species over time as well as those characteristics were then passed on to their children with high chance variation under domestication and this was also the first chapter in Darwin's book on the origins of species in this chapter Darwin argued that humans have shown that we can selectively breed animals with desired features for example we could breed a horse that could run very fast and or we could breed a dove with beautiful uh, tails so and to be able to do this all you do is that you grow randomly a bunch of animals and then you selectively choose the ones that uh, have desired features and then you breed them this was artificial selection so Darwin was pretty convinced that species could modify and change over time and that you could artificially select them to have desired characteristics but how did evolution work in nature how did a species change in nature because there was no artificial selection going on no one was picking them then how did species evolve over time and the answer to this came to Darwin after reading Thomas Malthus who was a famous economist his book called the essay on principle of population Malthus said that any species multiplied very fast they multiplied geometrically but the supply for food or other resources necessary for their survival either remain constant or increase slowly so eventually what happened is that when the species had multiplied so much the resources necessary for survival became scarce and what this meant is that all the individuals of the species would be fighting for their survival to get the limited resources and what this meant is that and Darwin now saw the matters clearly that this meant that the species competed to eat, to reproduce, to avoid predators. Essentially there was a game going on to survive because the resources were limited. And so what happened is the following. If by random chance some individuals were born which made their chances of survival better, they would survive. And those characteristics would then be passed on to their children with a high chance and and that is how these characteristics would come to dominate the population over se over several generations and this is when Darwin realized the natural selection is the primary driver of evolution on the origins of species was the work of Charles Darwin that was published after almost a lifetime of Darwin's work Darwin knew that his theory was was so mind-bending that that public would probably reject his hypothesis unless he made a very good case so he collected for almost 50 years uh, evidence before he put together his book to understand how his theory and how evolution works let's assume certain facts one is that offspring of any species slightly vary for example siblings that are born to the same parents have slightly different heights they have slightly different eye colors Fact number two, animal characteristics are passed on with a very high chance to their children. For example, pa children of tall parents are likely to be tall. Uh, and the resources necessary for survival are limited that several individuals of uh, a species are fighting to get them. Under these circumstances, we assume that natural selection kicks in. That individuals that are born by random chance, I reiterate, by random chance that make them uh, fit that make that make their chances slightly better they have a slightly better chance to survive or to win in this game and therefore they have a slightly better chance to reproduce and have offspring and because these characteristics are then passed on to their children the these characteristics which make them beneficial come to be come to populate the majority but becomes the majority and this is how 
a species evolved. For example, take a look at a giraffe. A, it, let's say a, a giraffe who initially had a short neck, and this is one of the theories why giraffes have long neck, is that initially giraffes used to have shorter neck, but let's say they are born in an environment where fruits are high up in the tree. If by random chance a giraffe is born that has a slightly taller neck, then that giraffe will have a much better chance of survival while his peers will die out. And that is, and eventually his children will have taller necks and, and this will continue to increase, the long necks will continue to increase, increase until the, they have a, comp they need to have an advantage over other, uh, other people who are, others uh, struggling peers. So next we'll continue to rise. The further evidence for natural selection is the evolution of peppered moth in England and this has been studied greatly. Evolution generally works over millions of years but under certain circumstances such that when the environmental pressure is very strong it can occur at a much faster rate. For example originally in England the moths were light colored the majority of them and the this helped them uh, this gave them an advantage because think about this if they rested on a tree which was light colored the dark colored moth will uh, appear out will stand out and will be eaten by the predator however the light colored will be camouflaged successfully however uh, during the industrial revolution what happened is that the light colored plants died out and the trees became uh, dark by the suit by the population and this gave an advantage to the dark colored and within a few decades the the story completely changed upside down the majority of the dark colored moth became 98 percent in population all this is good but we have still not answered how does we have understood how a species evolve over time but what we have not yet talked about is that how does a monkey evolve into a human being how do how do species change so that they become a completely different species? And the answer to that is that in Darwin's view, there was no fixity of species. Two species were, were just two different, were just such that a long time ago there were children of the same parents. It just so happens is that a particular, what is a species? A species is just a population of animals who can breed and they have an average set of characteristics and they are just variations on those average characteristics. However, over time, these average characteristics can evolve if the environment changes, if due to natural selection and evolution. If, however, what happens is that due to some external factors, these population is divided into two parts. Let's say a flood happens or the species migrate and then these two species which are distinctly located in different environments over time they will branch out so much that they will eventually become to be as two distinct species and will no longer be able to breed with each other. And that is one of the case with, with apes and humans that we once were apes. It's just that our, our ancestor decided to move out of the jungle and walk on the ground that they became humans and the apes in the jungle remained apes. So concluding there has been widespread opposition to the theory, however, it is part of science and it is accepted. People, for example, ask questions such as, if man evolved from monkeys, why are monkeys still around? And also they ask that, why don't we see evolution around us? Why don't we see a dog evolving into a wolf or a monkey evolving into a man? Uh, hopefully you now understand why these, uh, why these uh, oppositions are, uh, are, do not work. Um, of the three hypotheses that I discussed above, science supports the third. Intelligent life can come to be from simple atoms on its own. And the philosophical consequences of the theory of evolution are, are profound. For example, the, it rules out the, nece the necessity of a creator. A creator may be around, but it is not necessary to create life. Life can come to be on its own by evolving under the laws of the universe. The second thing which I found very interesting is that no matter who you are, if you're listening to my lecture, if we go back in time, we will find that we once had a common ancestor. And it doesn't matter even if you are a chimpanzee or a fish, if we go back in time long enough, we once will find that we once had a common mother and father. All life on this planet is connected.
It can be said that if an alien species land on Earth, the yardstick with which they will measure how intelligent we are, they will simply ask themselves, well, have humans, have they figured out evolution yet? And by that measure, we would have proved to be intelligent. Thank you.